All right, so uh, today we're talking about recovery protocols. Uh, and so there'll be some, uh, you know, in, in the introduction class, we talk about Aries, we talk about how to, uh, you know, we want to re restore the database after a crash. And in the Amory database, we're going to do the exact same thing, right? Obviously that if we, if we the database, uh, you know, if the database shuts down or crashes, we, want to, we want, to, want to be able to restart the system and put the database back into the correct state such that we guarantee the asset atomicity and durability guarantees that we would have in an asset system, right? So atomicity means that we can't have any partial transactions. Consistency means that we don't put the database in like a funky state where like the data could be actually incorrect. And then durability just means that if, you know, if we write changes to the database, we tell it to commit a transaction, the outside world hears that that transaction is committed. When we come back, then all our changes are still there. So, Every recovery algorithm is going to have two parts. There's the part we're going to do at runtime, where as we process transactions and they update the database, we're going to take some extra steps to record some extra information so that if we crash and come back, we can look at that extra, extra information and figure out what was going on in the system to put us back in the correct state. Um, and then there's the recovery protocol that you actually do after the crash or after a failure, where you look at all the information you've collected that you've, that you've generated in the, the normal processing, and then you figure out, all right, what do I need to do to go back? So we'll talk a little bit about, about uh, we're going to spend time talking about in-memory database uh, uh, recovery or logging protocols, recovery protocols. The paper I had you guys read was not an in-memory database, and I'll explain why I assigned it. Um, the, there's actually not a lot, not, not many papers about in-memory database log recovery. When you look back at the early ones from the 1980s, they all make this big assumption that the log or the database itself will be backed by what is called non-volatile memory or, or persistent memory. And back in the 1980s, this just meant battery backed up DRAM. So you had a little battery on the motherboard that could be triggered anytime you recognize that the power was going to go down, and you use the battery to actually sh gracefully shut down the memory, write it out to disk. And so when you came back, all your contents or DRAM were still there. So battery backed up DRAM has been around for a long time. It's not widely used because it takes up space on the motherboard. Right? They, they're great until you try to use them and they don't work, right? because you have to make sure the battery is always functioning correctly. Um, so you don't see that too often in the wild. You certainly can't go to Amazon and get an AWS instance that has, has this. So the other kind of persistent memory, though, instead of being battery backed up DRAM, is to use what is called true non-volatile memory or true persistent memory. And so for years and years and years, every time I taught this class, I would say, oh, non you know, real non-volatile memory is coming out one year from now, one year from now. And finally, last year, Intel stepped up and released true non-volatile memory called the Optane. Uh, and again, the idea is that it just goes into a DIMM slot like you normally would with DRAM, but this has magic inside of it that says, uh, you know, if, if, I, if I lose power, I, I still retain everything. It's going to be slightly slower than DRAM, but it's going to be way faster than, than SSDs. So we're not going to talk about NVM stuff or persistent memory right now. We'll cover this at the end of the semester. Yes? The question is, is it really expensive? Uh, what's that? What did you say? Oh. Um, yes and no. It's not, like, it's not like outlandish. It's like maybe a couple thousand for like 128 gigs or something like that. I don't know the exact prices. I don't think Intel publishes them. You can maybe only get it from OEM. But yeah, it's, it's, it's more expensive than DRAM, more expensive than, than SSDs, but like it has certain properties that you can't get out of an SSD. Um, you can also get it in a form factor that goes down on the PCI Express, so it is, that looks like a flash drive, even though it's the special. Basically, it's not NAND flash, it's not DRAM, it's a special uh, storage medium called phase change memory. You can get it in other form factors, and that one, though the prices are close to what SSDs are, but for the DIMM stuff, it's, it's more pricey. Again, yeah, we'll cover this. Uh, it, later in the semester. Um, the point I'm just to make is like, uh, if you go read the early papers on logging protocols for in-memory databases, they all assume this, but back then they didn't really have it. Um, so we still have to design our protocols using, uh, you know, re relying on SSDs or spinning disk hard drives. So the good thing though for us in an in-memory database is that our recovery protocol is going to be slightly easier than what we have to do in a disk ordinary system. And this is just due to the fact that since the primary stores location of the database is in memory, 
when we crash or there's a failure, that memory is wiped. So when we come back, all we need to do is just load in the last checkpoint and replay the log from disk. And we don't have to worry about any dirty pages from transactions that may be lingering around on disk that we have to reverse as we would in a discording system. So we don't have to track dirty pages right, as we run. Like if a transaction makes some changes and then it doesn't commit and we crash, well, all those memory pages get wiped. So that's fine. All right, so this means now we don't have to store any undo records to reverse these things because there's nothing to reverse. The only thing we need to write out the disk is just redo information. The other big difference is going to be that we're not going to log any changes that we make to indexes. So in a disk-based system, as I update my, my table and it, that, that causes updates to the indexes, I'm also going to create log records that, 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 that record the changes to the index. But in memory database, I don't do any of that. And so when I crash, I have to load the database back in from the checkpoint file anyway. So the disk is way more expensive than doing the computation. So I'm just going to rebuild the indexes on the fly as I load the checkpoint in. And in, in a, in a disk-based system, you don't do that. So we still have to deal with the fact that disk is going to be slow. And so we still want to take advantage of all the optimizations we would do in a, in a disk ordering system, like group commit, batching things, uh, doing speculative lock releases, things like that. All those uh, optimizations are still going to apply for us here, uh, even though we're in memory. So today I'm going to talk about first about different types of logging schemes. And again, the paper you had you guys read was for a disk oriented system, but it, it's relying on multi versioning. So I think that's kind of really interesting, and we'll see how that works. And then we'll talk about checkpoint protocols. Um, and these two here are what you need for to guarantee your database will actually. This is all you really need to guarantee your database is durable. This is a way to speed things up after a crash. And this is a way to speed things up if you're going to do a restart and you know that it's going to be scheduled at a certain time. So this one you have, absolutely have to have. This one is an optimization to make this go faster. And this is an optimization to avoid having to do all of this. OK? All right. So at a high level, there's two types of logging schemes. There's physical logging and logical logging. Physical logging is like taking a diff as you would in, in Git. The idea is that we're going to record the changes that we're making to a record at the byte level. If you think also in MVCC, when, if you're using a Delta store, I'm just recording. I, here's the column that I modified, and here, here's the new value. Right? So then after, after a crash, we're essentially just going to replay these log records and reapply the changes to, to the columns. The other approach is to do logical logging. And this is where, instead of storing, again, the low-level bytes we're modifying within a tuple, we're just going to store the high-level operation that the cap application invoked or requested on the data system to make that change. So it would be like recording the actual SQL statements that they would send us, the insert, update, delete queries. So the idea here is if I have a database, but the table has 1,000 tuples, right, make it big, make it a billion tuples. If I'm doing physical logging with one query that needs to update all 1 billion tuples, then I need 1 billion log records that correspond to every single tuple that I've, that I've modified. But if I'm doing logical logging, then I only need to record that single update statement. And that's enough for my system after restart to re replay that update and put me back in the correct state. So logical logging is going to be much smaller log files and potentially much faster to commit at runtime. But the, the recovery process is, could potentially be more expensive because there's no magic I can do to make this update go faster during recovery. So it, if I have to update a billion tuples and it takes an hour the first time I run it, after I crash and restart and replay this update query, it might take uh, you know, an hour again. So it might you know, delay the amount of time it takes for, me, for, the, for my database to come back online. So for this reason, most systems are going to choose physical logging. Um, and this is only used in certain specialized systems. Okay. Now the question is, when do we actually lo flush the log records that a transaction generates? So the first approach is to do all at once. Meaning, as a transaction runs and they're making changes, they're executing queries that update the, the database, doesn't matter whether it's physical logging or logical logging, I'm just going to record in memory in this log buffer for my transaction, here's, here's all the log records. And only when the transaction says, go ahead and commit, if we pass our validation, then we hand off those log records to some our logger thread, who then flushes it out to disk. Of course, we have to wait until uh, all those log records are written to disk before we can tell the outside world that our transaction committed. So it could be, a, you know, if I update a billion tuples and I have a billion log records, I have to wait for those one billion log, log, log records to get written to disk. The other approach is to do incremental flushing. And this is, 
as transactions run and they're accumulating these, these log records, when, they're, when they're, uh, their local log buffer gets full, they can hand that off to some, some writer thread who can then start writing that out the disk and then they get a new log buffer to start filling up with new log records. So that means that if there's a crash now, in the log, there may be log records from transactions that did not commit yet, right? Because we're allowing things to get written out before, uh, before everything is finished. So in this approach here for the all at once, this makes recovery easier because I know if I crash and come back, I'm almost never going to see log records from transactions that did not commit. I may see a transaction did commit and they start writing out all their log records, but they bef we crash before we write the rest of it and the commit message. In that case, I certainly have to undo it. But most of the times, I'll have all the log records. In the case of incremental flushing, I have to do some extra work to go figure out, here's a bunch of transactions that, that haven't finished. Let me go ahead and, and uh, make sure I don't reapply their changes. So this is not that big of a deal because, again, we don't write out any dirty pages. We're reloading from the checkpoint anyway. It's just we have to do some extra processing in the log to make sure we skip things that shouldn't have committed. Yes? So in the first thing, if a transaction is like, say, inserting 10 billion tuples, yes. and uh, it inserted them and, oh, sorry, it uh, changed them and uh, then it did something. Yes. And those 5 billion things got stored. Yes. And last 5 billion things did not get stored. Correct. And then it like crashed also. Yes. So now, how do you undo these last five billion things? Because again, there's nothing to undo. Nobody updated things. But, but updated what? It updated in-memory pages. Yeah. We crash. That memory is gone. So when we when we come back online, we're loading the checkpoint. There, there's there's no dirty pages, right? It's just in this case here. Like we'll talk about uh, replication next next class. Um, but like, it's like, sort of like, when do I send the outside world like a, to, to, to a replica? Hey, here's, here's all my, my updates for my transaction. In this case also too, if I update 10 billion tuples, I have to have a log buffer that can handle 10 billion tuples. And I may, may run out of memory. So for this reason, most systems are going to do this approach. But there are some advantages to doing this. All right, these are the standard techniques we talked about before uh, in the introduction class that would still apply for us in an in-memory system. So we'll do group commit. It just means that we have this, this log buffer that we can fill in with log records from different transactions and that we can then flush them out whenever that log buffer is full and then have a log buffer, another log buffer start getting filled up by other transactions. Um, and the idea here is we want to amortize the f-sync cost across multiple transactions. So if you're the first guy getting added to this queue, then yes, you wait the longest because you have to wait for the log buffer to get full. But if you're the last guy, then you're basically running with a dedicated f-sync call, right? So this is a really old technique. As I said, it's used in pretty much every system today. It was originally developed for this thing called FastPath, which was a uh, specialized in-memory engine for I IBM's IMS from the early 1980s. But like I said, every everyone pretty much does, does this today. The other thing we can do now, which is related to the speculative lock release or speculative uh, reads we saw under Hecaton and our MVCC is that when a transaction goes, goes ahead and commits, uh, we don't have to wait for the, the, the updates to become durable on disk before we release all our locks, we can let other transactions start modifying the tuples that we've modified, assuming those log records will get, will get written out, our log records will get written out to the disk. Or they read things that we've modified and may, before the log records get flushed to disk. And we have to sort of keep track of that. We did these speculative reads, even though the transaction is logically committed, physically it hasn't gotten made to the disk yet. So we know that if any transaction reads something that we wrote, we have, they have to get stalled until, the, until we actually flush the disk. So that means that my read-only transaction, that it reads an update from, from your transaction, uh, but your transaction has been written the disk yet, I have to wait for you to get flushed before I can get committed. Again, th this is a standard technique. And our MVCC, you know, we would know this information because we can maintain, some, maintain the state map that says this transaction's log records have not been flushed yet, so therefore you can't commit right away if you read something from them. Okay. So I've sort of alluded to this a little bit now in, in this in the last couple of slides where if we have a multi-version system, then the, the delta records we're going to generate for MVCC are more or less the same thing we're going to generate for in our, in our log. It's not exactly the same because depending how, if we're doing oldest and newest or newest to oldest, right, we, we could be generating redo records or undo records all right, for our, our tuples we're modifying, whereas the the, the, the the database log file wants to have redo records, at least for an in-memory database. 
So the idea is that what if we can combine all the metadata we're generating for MVCC with all the metadata we're gen generating with the log file, and that way we're not duplicating this effort. So that was the paper I had you guys read for today. Uh, it came out in, uh, just this year, in, in, or last year, in VLDB 2019. So as I said, it's not an in-memory system, uh, but it's a multi-version system, and I think it's a good description of how you can piggyback off of the MVCC metadata you're generating to make logging uh, uh, make, uh, work, work better. So, it's, so this protocol is going to be a physical logging protocol that's going to rely on the, the database system's time travel table, which they call the version store, the tempdb. So we're going to rely on that the time travel table to act almost as, as a recovery log. So what will happen is we'll start writing out the changes we make to this version store uh, to a log file, but they're only going to contain essentially the redo records of, of the versions we've generated. And then when we, when we crash and come back, all we need to do now is just suck in this version store into disk, or sorry, alpha, alpha disk into memory, and we don't need to undo anything right away. I, if we just bring those pages back in, then the database is now at the state it was at the moment of the crash. And then we just need to do some background extra work to do this logical revert to make sure that we don't read things, we don't persist uh, versions from transactions that, have not, that did not commit at the crash. So the problem they were trying to solve that they mentioned in the paper is that uh, they had certain customers running on Azure in the cloud or SQL Server in the cloud where they would have these really long transactions that when there was a crash, now you need to undo all the changes. So this 10 billion table update we just mentioned. Like if I crash before I finish all updating all those, those tuples, when I come back, now I gotta un you know, spend a long time undoing everything. So what they wanted to do is have what they call constant time recovery, which was saying that the, the time it's gonna take for me to restore the database back to the correct state is only contingent on the size of the log file. Because I just need to be able to read that in the redo phase. And I don't have to worry about how much time I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend going reverse direction to undo things. Does that make sense? So let, let's go through some examples and then uh, we'll see how it works. So again, this is with SQL Server. It's, it's Azure SQL is the name of, of, the, of the cloud version of it. But as I said, they, for this feature, they're, they're putting out in the, uh, the on-premise uh, version, which includes the Linux one. So they're doing time travel uh, d uh, version storage, but they just call it a, a version store. And so the idea here is that you have the main table, and this has the, the latest version, and they're doing newest to oldest. So this, this version has a pointer now to another tuple. Uh, that's the, 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 you know, the, the next oldest tuple, and then there's a version chain allowed to, to go back in time to find previous versions. So now if a transaction comes along and wants to update this tuple here, we first make a copy of the current version into our version store, update the pointer to, to connect the chain, and then we can overwrite the old version with, with our new one here. Right? So the idea here is that they want to leverage this thing, which is basically redo information, all right, to, to then allow them to restore the state of the database just by loading this thing back in. So there's gonna be two variants of how they're gonna do this persistent version store. So the first one is that they're gonna do in-row versioning, where this is actually, you're not gonna use the version store. This is gonna look like that Cicada inlining, where instead of making a whole copy of the tuple and putting it into the version store, they're gonna pack it in the in this special field inside the tuple of just the delta record of what got what was modified. And then that gets written out to the write ahead log just as it would any other tuple update. And that's enough information to, to allow me to recreate the database state. And I'll show this in the next slide. And then the, for the off row versioning, which is actually using the time travel table, instead of having a time travel table for every single logical table in your database, they're going to have one giant time travel table for every single table. This is way different. I, I've never seen this used before. And so the way it works is that the, in here, like instead of having uh, discrete columns or attributes that represent the, the, the columns in the table, they're just gonna have one column that, and then just store a blob or, or a byte string of the serialized data for that tuple. And that way you can store any tables, tuples inside there. Because there's no, uh, we're, all, we're, sort of, we're not doing any processing on looking at the actual columns in this. Right? We're just almost using it as a, in-memory log that then, that, that then gets flushed. So they're also going to modify the, the, the data table data structure itself 
so that you can do fast concurrent inserts. So that means that they're going to partition the database in memory so that, or sorry, the table in memory so that different threads write to different regions of, of the table. Um, and then uh, this allows you to, uh, you sort of write them out very, very quickly to the write-ahead log. Um, and you never can allow to go back and update any other tuple, right? It's only append only. And then now you do sequential writes out to the log, which is efficient. So this is the in-row versioning. This is the same thing we talked about with Cicada. Basically, they, uh, when I do an update of this tuple, instead of making this copy of this old version and putting it into the time travel table, those embed a delta record inside of here. And then that just gets written out to a, to a write-ahead log just as you normally would. So an important distinction here about why they can do this and why we can't do this very easily in an in-memory database system is that in a disk-oriented database, the tuples can be variable length. In an in, a in memory database, we said we had the, the primary location of a tuple has to be fixed length. So we either have to allocate this delta space for every single tuple, and it can only be a certain size if we're in memory. But in a disk based database, I can leave this thing empty, and then if I decide to use it when I insert the new tuple, then I just grab a new slot in my page and can write everything out. All right? So that, that's one important distinction between what they're doing and what, how you do this in an in memory database. Okay. So let's see how they're going to do recovery. So this is, almost looks like standard Aries, except that under Aries, the, the database is not available until you complete the undo phase. In their world, it's immediately available after the redo phase. Because all they're doing is lo they're loading back in that version store, and then all the versions, the old versions that are around are now, uh, are, you know, are now available. And then we just piggyback up all that same uh, version detection or, or identification that we do under MVCC to identify which tuples are actually visible to our transaction. So analysis phase, again, we just scan through the log up to the last checkpoint to figure out what transactions are running. And then in the redo, redo phase, uh, we're going to replay the write-ahead log to put us back in the correct state for both the main table and the version store. But as I said, the version store is only gonna, it's going, to, going to contain versions from, from transactions that did not commit as well as in the main table, but because we're MVCC, we know what the timestamps were for those versions, and then when we come back online and start running regular transactions, we would know to skip over things that were uncommitted. Because right? we're going to maintain this global state map that says, here's all the transactions that are around, and here's what their status is. Then in the undo phase, we let transactions to start execute, uh, and when they find things that, that, that are aborted, they can go ahead and either clean them up, or there will be a separate background process to, to, to clean them up and, uh, yeah, asynchronously. And they, rec they refer to this thing as, as a logical revert. But from, from my purpose, it just sounds like garbage collection. Although it's, the fact that transactions can do slightly, something slightly different when they find aborted versions is not exactly garbage collection. So th I, this is already what it says. So you have separate threads. They're going to scan through the blocks, find all reclaimable versions. And then if you recognize that the, uh, the latest version of a tuple is in the version store, then you just move it back at, you know, into the main table. Right? And again, that's the same thing we would see in, in regular GC that we've already talked about. The only one optimization they do, 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 do that's slightly different is if a transaction recognizes that, oh, in the main table I see the current version, the master version of the tuple is from an aborted transaction, then instead of copying that out and making a new version in the, in the time travel, they just completely overwrite it. Right? So, Again, like I said, I think this is interesting because this is, although it's a disk-based system, it's showing you how, you how you can use the MVCC metadata to do a tip or type of logging scheme and, and potentially get better performance. Any questions about this? There's this other bit about the syslog where they would store uh, changes for non-version data structures like page tables and, and B plus three layouts. Uh, that, again, we, all, we can ignore all of that in an in in-memory system because we're, we're not going to maintain that information. Yes? Are, are they paying like, uh, extra costs when they are reading from the uh, data storage and that, that, that thing is serialized so they can like... Yeah, so he's describing it and he's correct. Like, does this mean at runtime, if I need to go re read an old version, I have to go to the, the version store and everything just serialized as a blob, do I pay a penalty for, for having to read that? Yes. But I think they measured it, it's kind of small. Same thing with the delta record. If, I, if the in-row delta record, I have to re replay it, and they pay computational costs for that. Like if it is in-row, then you don't have much penalty, right? This is what they say that. It yeah, but, like, but it's, it's, not as, it's not as free as like going, reading, and having everything there. I agree with you, yes. 
And that's why we use Delta Store in our own system. All right, most transactions, I, 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 I don't remember if they say this in the paper, most transactions don't update all columns. It's right, the Delta Store, is, the end row version is, pretty, is usually going to be enough. So this idea of what they're doing is not new. Uh, this is actually very similar to how Postgres was originally designed back in like 1986. Like in Postgres, if you, there's a paper called The Design of Postgres, uh, and Sternbaker talks about how, oh, well, the, the log is not really a log file, it's a log table, and everything's it's getting appended to that, and that gets flushed out. Um, so at a high level, this, this is very similar. And they claim the difference here is that this paper is about taking a system that was not designed to be multi-version in this way and, and adding this after the fact, whereas Postgres was designed from the very beginning to be like this. And again, Postgres is an MVC system. Okay? All right, so, so again, this is, a, this, is, uh, this is a protocol that takes advantage of the fact that we're multi-versioned. Um, so now let's look at another logging protocol that is for MMA databases that's more about how you could architect the system to be aware of what the, the, how, so the CPUs actually work and how they operate. So Silo is a in-memory OTP uh, embedded database engine that was developed out of, out of Harvard by Eddie Kohler. Um, so it's not going to be multi-version. It's going to be a single version system that uses OCC, and they're going to use an epoch-based garbage collection protocol to keep track of when you actually commit transactions and flush things out the disk. So this is, Silo is the same people that developed the mastery. They wrote mastery first and then they built Silo around it. So the paper, uh, this paper here is a, proposes a, a physical logging technique called Silo R that is going to try to paralyze as much as possible all the logging, checkpoint, and recovery processes so that we get the best, uh, best performance. And the way they're going to do this is that they're going to disaggregate the log across multiple files, across, and which could be stored on multiple disks, and allow them to be read in, in parallel at the same time. So the, way, so the way this works is that for every single CPU socket in my system, I'm going to have a dedicated logger thread and a dedicated log file. Right? And the idea here is that we want to localize all the memory writes we have to do to the, our, our local socket, so we're never going over shared memory to, a, to another, another socket over the interconnect. And then that way, that log thread can be just you know, pumping data out as fast as possible to, to the log file. So now, as transactions run, they're going to get a log buffer from their local uh, uh, logger thread, and then write out just redo information. Because we're in memory, we don't have to do any undo. Uh, and in this case here, they are, to make it simple, assume that all the log records for a transaction will be written out. Actually, you know, in this case here, you can do incremental. But in most cases, it could be done all at once. All right, so again, I've already said some of this. So every logger thread is going to have a pool of log buffers. We hand them out to our, our, our local worker threads that are on the same socket as us. When my buffer gets full, I hand it back to my logger thread. The logger thread can then start writing it out the disk, uh, which means you can do incremental flushes. And then the worker thread tries to get a new log buffer. If there's no more lo uh, log buffers available, then the worker thread has to stall until the logger thread comes back and says, uh, you know, he, he, I flushed out enough. Here, here's a new log thread or log buffer. So now what is going to happen though is that because now our, our log file is broken up across multiple files on different disks, it may be the case our transaction might modify data that's managed by different CPU sockets and therefore the log records for that transaction might be broken up across different disks. So I need a way to coordinate all of them so that I don't have, you know, if I touch two log files, my transaction commits, the first log file gets flushed but the second one doesn't, and then I tell the outside world that I crashed, and I come back, and now the, you know, half the updates from the other log file never made it to disk. So you need a way to coordinate all of them so that, so that you know that all the updates for a transaction have been safely flushed. So this is what the epoch is going to do for us. So what's going to happen is every so often, I, all the log, the, this, this epoch will get incremented, and that forces every log thread to write out their, the current contents of the log buffer. And then we record what was the epoch everyone wrote at. And now we know that any transaction that has been committed and, 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 and flushed to disk prior to that epoch is now durable. And we can tell the outside world that we've committed. They're going to use this epoch in other ways of the system to minimize, again, coordination across different CPU sockets. But for our purposes here, we can just focus on how we do it uh, for logging.
So our log record just contain the ID of the transaction that modified a, a given tuple. And silo is going to be do serializable, uh, uh, serializable isolation or serializable scheduling. So that means that the, the transaction ID will be enough to guarantee the ordering, uh, the correct ordering of the updates to the, the, the database. So if we just replay the log in the order of the transaction IDs, then that will put us back into the correct state. At lower isolation levels, you can't do this because I, I may update something and you may read something and update something else. We, in the, unless we have a log sequence number to order those things, we may come back and replay things in a different order. So by being serializable, we can guarantee that this, is, this will put it back to the correct state. Yes? So it isn't the snapshot isolation if you guarantee that the... It's not necessarily... Uh, yeah, if, if your first writer wins, then that also solves that too. Yeah. The, the main takeaway is that the transaction ID is enough to guarantee the ordering to put you back in the correct state, and you don't need a separate log sequence number. Because okay. with a log sequence number, if an ID coordinated that across multiple uh, sockets, right. then that's a, that's a bottleneck. So the log file is going to be a triplet, just the table, the key, and the value that gets modified, and the value can just be the delta record. Right, of, of what the change actually was. So again, if, I, if I'm doing a simple query to update all the people that are lame with Matt and myself, then the, the, the log record would be, uh, we'll have a, a separate log record for every single tuple that this thing modified. All right. All right, so here's the high level architecture of the system. And again, the idea here is that I'm gonna expose to you or show you that you know, this is just physical logging, so there's nothing really novel being done here. It's how they organize the system that I think is actually quite interesting and is, is, is I don't see that, I haven't seen this in any other system. So again, the transactions are going to update, or the worker threads are going to execute transactions. So they're only going to execute these things as stored procedures. They call them one-stop transactions. But the basic idea is that we do a request, like an RPC, say execute this transaction, and all the program logic of what that transaction is going to do is embed inside the system. So we never go back to the client. So everything's done in, in one invocation. So when a transaction starts running, the worker thread has to go to the logger and get a, a log buffer. And once it has that, it can start fill, filling up the changes that, that it starts making to the database. And at some point, this log buffer will get full. So we hand it back to the logger thread and say, this thing's full. Please flush it for us. And we'll go ahead and get another log buffer. So then uh, now, at, at this point here, say that transaction's still running. This other epoch thread waits up and says, all right, now the new epoch is 200. So that's going to force all the logger threads in the system to now flush whatever buffers that they have, including any ones that, that were handed off before. So now the worker thread has to hand back the, the, the log buffer to, to the logging thread. Uh, and then it could keep on running. It could say, now give me another log buffer to start filling up. But in this case here, there aren't any more. So it's going to have to stall and wait. So now the logger thread can start flushing things out the disk. right? And as it flushes them, it frees up log space. And then we can hand back the log buffers and let this guy keep on running. So in the most simplest world, assume every transaction will be finished within an epoch. If, it's, if it spans multiple epochs, then you basically have to keep track of, like, this transaction was around. It spans multiple epochs. So you have to go back further in the log to try to figure out what actually happened to it. But the main idea here is that by having the, this back pressure, me pressure me mechanism where if we run out of log buffers, we don't allocate more memory, we, we make this guy stall, that prevents us from generating log records faster than we can actually uh, write them out the disk. Because right? otherwise, the log buffers just grow infinitely and we'll run, run out of space. So let's talk about what this, per, this persistent epoch thing actually does. So every, worker, every logger thread is going to have the, uh, its own file where it records all the, the delta records that transactions are generating when they run. But then there's going to be a special log file where we keep track of the highest epoch that all the log th all logger threads have flushed out successfully to disk. Now everyone is flushing at the same time when, when, the, persist when the epoch in increments, you tell everyone to flush, uh, but then it, they may not all happen exactly at the same speed, and only when everyone says, all right, I flushed it, then you go update in the, and update the persistent epoch. Now, you don't need this for correctness. This is actually just an optimization so that when you crash and come back, you can just look at this one file and say, all right, what's the epoch I need to start with? Otherwise, you'd have to go look at every, every single file to figure out what's the, the, you know, the, the intersection of the epoch across all of them. This is just an optimization. It's a nice to have. And the overhead of, of it is it's somewhat small other than an F-sync. Okay, 
So we know that if this thing gets written out the this, then we know that any transaction that executed in an epoch that's less than, less than or equal to our persistent epoch, we know is, is durable. So it looks like this. Say we have now three logger threads, right? And they each, each have their own log file, they're running out the disk. And they each have a bunch of worker threads. And again, these guys are just going and getting the log buffers from the, the logger threads. And then you have this now, the special uh, persistent epoch thread that's going to update the, the file on disk. Every so often now, the epoch changes. So everyone has, has to then flush out all the changes they have up to that epoch. Once they all then confirm with this epoch thread, uh, the persistent epoch thread that they've written out to disk, then we're allowed to go ahead and write out the persistent epoch file. So for this one, I, like I said, you don't need this for correctness. This is just an optimization. So I don't think you actually need this to be another f-sync. Like these, you, you want to f-sync to know that you actually made the disk. I think for this one, if you crash into f-sync, now you, you have to f-sync. You, if you're going to rely on this to figure out what the intersection is of the epoch across all of them, then you have to f-sync. Right? But that just, it could be just another five milliseconds. Yes? At every like 200, 300, are we also writing the pages out to this? Otherwise, we'll have to start. What, what pages? The in memory pages, right? We, we are writing them at, these are not checkpoints. They're not checkpoints, these are just log records. Then we have to start from like the starting thing. Three more slides, we'll get the checkpoints, yes. But yes, this is what checkpoint solves, yes. This is just, again, the architecture here is how to do disk aggregated log files across multiple disks and do you just have some sort of centralized location that you only update whenever this thing gets changed? In the silo paper, they do this every 40 milliseconds. So in a real system, this is problematic because if you need like sub-millisecond latency of your transactions, you're not going to be able to get that with this. You have to crank this thing down. Um, when I asked them why they picked 40 milliseconds, they just said this seemed like a decent number, right? So you could ratchet it down so this thing gets updated every 10 milliseconds or 5 milliseconds, but now you're flushing a lot and this thing's getting written out a lot. And you now could potentially have transactions that span multiple uh, epochs, and you have to do more stuff in recovery to handle this. All right, so now, next slide, we get to your question. So we'll talk about checkpoints in, uh, in, in a few more slides in more detail, but as he said, if you don't have checkpoints, then these log files grow forever, and when I crash and, and, re, and, and restart, I gotta go back and potentially look at the entire log file. So every so often they're going to take a checkpoint, and then when you uh, when you after on recovery you load the last checkpoint in, and that sort of bounds how much log file you have to look at, and they're going to rebuild the indexes based on the checkpoint, as I already said, because we're not going to make any log records for the indexes. Now, what is going to be different though than a disk-based system, which is super interesting, is that when they do recovery, instead of doing in the redo phase we saw with with SQL Server, where they start at some point in the past and they process log records going forward in time, silos actually can start at the end of the log file and go in reverse order and start playing log records from, from newest to oldest. And again, we can do this because we're in memory because we know that there's no dirty pages sitting around that got loaded in from the last checkpoint. So as we replay the log, we just need to know that what should be the final state of the, of the database, of, the, of a tuple, in order for me to say the database has, has been restored. So if I have a tuple that's been updated 20 times, if I'm going in reverse order, I don't need to replay that log record for all those 20 updates. I just need to find the last update and apply that. Right? That's totally different than, than, than as you would do this in a disk-oriented system because, again, dirty pages may have written a disk, so at some point I, need, I, need, I, I have to replay everything and then undo everything that shouldn't be around. Right? So what they're going to again, they're going to keep track of the transaction IDs in every tuple to keep track of what was the timestamp of when this tuple got updated. So if I, as I'm re replaying the log in reverse order, if I find a log record that has a timestamp that's that's smaller than the current tuple's timestamp, meaning it was updated by a transaction in the future that I replayed earlier in the log, then I can just ignore that log record and I don't have to apply it. So it may be the case if I'm only updating a small number of tuples. Uh, over and over again, my log, I may be able to realize that you know, with, within uh, you know, maybe the, the first megabyte of, of, of log record data, I can ignore everything else after that. I still want to look at it, but I still I don't have to replay it. Yes? This won't work if it's not single version, right? This question is, this won't work if it's not single versioned. 
if you don't need the old versions, then I think this is okay. And so you could say, all right, well, if I don't need the old versions, um, how do I say this? Well, one is no transaction. It's not like after a restart, any transaction that was running prior to the restart, it's not magically reappear when you come back. So there's no active tra time transactions with timestamps that could possibly even read those things. So I could just ignore them. Now, if I'm trying to do audit logs or retain things and do time travel queries, then yes, I gotta replay everything. Then yes, this won't work. I still need to re redo everything. But if I don't care about it, I just care about what is the latest version, then this works. The reason why most systems don't do this is that when you do replication, which we'll talk about next class, um, the replicas are essentially like in recovery mode and they're just replaying the log. So if you do it from oldest to newest, then the same mechanism you would do to do log replay is the same thing you can do for on the replicas. If now I have a specialized recovery mode where I can go reverse order, but only on the single node, then I have to have basically re-implement this twice. So Silo is the only system I know that does this. It's just a, it's, it's an interesting way to think about it, though, which I like. OK, uh, this one I think we've already talked about, right? So we go, uh, we go look in the persistent epoch file, figure out what the most, uh, the most recent persistent epoch that was flushed to disk. Then as our, 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 our logger threads st start replaying the log, they just ignore anything that's greater than this persistent epoch. And actually, I already said this all before, that because we're going newest to oldest, if I, if I recognize that the, the tuple has already been modified by a transaction that came later in the log that I've already processed, then I don't need to re replay that log record. OK? OK. So now we also get to checkpoints in more detail. As, as we already said, the log file can grow forever. Uh, so that means that I potentially have to replay the entire log every single time I have to restart. Right? If I have a one year's worth of log without a checkpoint, then it potentially take me one year to restore the database, which is nonsense. Like nobody could do this. So for an in-memory checkpoint, uh, the different approaches we're going to choose are, are going to be tightly coupled with our concurrent control scheme. And in some ways, if we're, if we're focusing on a multi-version systems, MVCC, then checkpoints essentially can become easy if we, depending on how you know what we want the consistency level to be in our checkpoint. Because right, it could just be, we just have a, a start a transaction that takes a snapshot, scans through a table, and we just write out all the versions of the tuple that were visible to our snapshot. And anything that's not visible to us, meaning it came in the future, we'll, we'll, just, we'll have the log records and we just replay those. All right. So there's a paper written by uh, Dan Abadi, who did some early work on column source uh, a few years ago in Sigbot. He basically lays out what are the ideal properties you'd want for a checkpointing scheme in an in-memory database system. And these sort of seem obvious, but it's important just to keep these back of our mind. So obviously, we don't want to slow down the regular transaction processing because it's not good if you know, we can run really fast and all of a sudden we take a checkpoint, and now the speed of our system is cut in by half. So the conventional wisdom for checkpointing schemes is that about a 10 to 15% overhead is considered acceptable. So every so, you know, every so often, if I'm taking a checkpoint, if I get 10% slower, then people are OK with that. Likewise, you don't want a sort of huge latency spikes, meaning I don't want a blocking checkpoint scheme. I don't want to block the system or lock a table while I take the checkpoint and have all these transactions queue up behind this. And then finally, I release the lock, and then they're allowed to run, because that's going to be a huge spike in our latency. And people, people would pay attention to this. And the last one also, too, is that we don't want to require any excessive memory overhead, meaning ideally, we don't have to take you know, a complete copy of the database in memory, as we write down a checkpoint, right, we want to be able to, to, to minimize that overhead. Because right? that puts pressure on, the, on, on our DIMMs and our memory bandwidth and our caches. So we reduce this as much as possible. So let's talk about the different properties you can have for, for a checkpoint for an in-memory database. So this, looks, this one here is this idea here is very similar to what we talked about for disk-based systems last semester. So you have this notion of fuzzy versus consistent checkpoints. So a consistent checkpoint is when the snapshot of the database that's written to disk only contains updates from transactions that committed. Again, think of just like under MVCC with snapshot isolation. The, the, the file I write to disk only contains the, the updates from transactions that committed before the transaction started. So now when I cr uh, crash and restart, when I load the checkpoint in, I don't have to worry about, is my ch does my checkpoint 
contain changes from uncommitted transactions. It only contains changes from committed transactions. So again, this is easy to do with MVCC. I run, run my query that scans the entire table and write it out. The other approach is to do fuzzy checkpoints. Well, this is where the snapshot could contain updates from transactions that committed after my checkpoint started. So my checkpoint starts running, and I have a, 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 a transaction that updates two, two, two tuples. And say I scan through uh, half the table, uh, then the transaction updates a, a tuple we've, I've already passed through, but a tuple I haven't passed through yet. My checkpoint now contain half the updates of that transaction. So now I have to do some extra stuff when I come back and recognize that, oh, there's an update that I, I, I may have missed because this guy was running when I, run, when I was running. And I make sure I find the log records to, to, to reapply things correctly. So uh, this is the easiest to do right, with MVCC. This one is, could potentially be faster um, and have less mo memory overhead because now I don't have to worry about maintaining old versions uh, and, and pausing the garbage collector. Um, most, I, most systems choose this. This one has advantages for storage overhead. The next is how we're actually going to do the, 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 uh, the, the checkpoint. So as I already said, a do-it-yourself implementation of this would be just a, a sequential scan on the table and write out every single tuple that I find that's visible to me. Right? Another approach is to do an OS fork. Um, so this idea is interesting. Because of an MMRE database, when we call fork in the operating system, what happens? Right? We have a child process. What's in that child process memory? It's the exact same thing as the parent process, right? Yes, question. But it's not like on demand, right? It's on demand, like you don't copy the entire thing. Correct, yeah, so the way it works is there's copy and write. So I call fork, the child process now has mapped in its, in its virtual memory table all the same pages as the parent process. But if the parent process updates any of those pages, or if I, my child process updates any of those pages, then the OS will make a copy of it and, and remap it uh, for your process. So as the parent process starts modifying the, in memory the, the database, the child process won't see this. So the only sort of well-known database system that actually does this approach is Redis. So this is the Red, how Redis takes checkpoints. And they can do this because they're single-threaded uh, single threaded engine. So it is pause transactions, do the fork, and then now the child process can has a consistent snapshot that it can start writing out the disk. Right? If you don't if you're, going to allow, if you're not going to pause all transactions or, or updates while you do this, then in the child process, you now need to reconcile the database to remove any uh, uncommitted changes from transactions that were running at the time you, for, you forked. So Hyper actually did this back in the day. So this is a paper from 2011. This is the first version of Hyper. It was actually influenced by a system that I was working on or helped build, HDOR, which, which then became VoltDB. So they basically sort of built their own version of, of VoltDB but they also wanted to do analytical queries. So they would do OS fork, and then on the child process, they could run analytical queries without slowing down the, 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 the parent process who was running transactions. And then they also could then take the child process and write out that checkpoint to disk, with, again, without slowing down the, um, slowing down the parent process ex execution. But because now when they took the checkpoint, or did the fork, there might have been some in-flight transactions that were running at the same time, they then, in the child process, you need to look at the undo logs for those transactions, which are, which are in memory, and make sure you reverse the database, re reverse those changes, so that, again, you have a consistent snapshot. And then, and then after some period of time, either when the checkpoint was written to disk, or when you're, when you're finished processing your analytical queries, they would kill the child process, all the memory gets cleaned up, and then the, the parent would fork it again. So, again, Redis is the only one that does this. They, it's, it's easy to do because they're single-threaded. Uh, I don't know of any other system other than Hyper that, that has attempted this. Well, we tried to do this in HDOR, but we were based on the JVM. If you read the manual for the JVM, it says don't fork it. Uh, we said screw that, and we forked it anyway. Uh, but it has all sorts of problems because, like, the garbage, like, you have a bunch of zombie threads because, like, the garbage collector doesn't get, doesn't start, keep running again. Other background things don't run. So it would work, but it, it, was, it was a bad idea. Okay. The next issue is that what are we actually going to store in our checkpoint? Okay, the two approaches are do complete checkpoints, the delta checkpoints. Complete checkpoints is taking whatever's in my snapshot of my, of, my, of my table or my tables in my database and just write that them out entirely out the disk. The delta checkpoint is where you try to recognize, well, what has changed since the last time I took a checkpoint and only write out those, you know, those updates. So most systems do this. 
right? The only system that I know that does delta checkpoints is Hecatom, right? Because the issue is that with a complete checkpoint, from a sort of a, a sort of administrative management standpoint, I have this file now on disk that I can say, oh, this is my checkpoint. This is the you know, exact snapshot of the database at this given time. With the delta checkpoint, I need to retain a bunch of deltas because there may be some updates that were in this snapshot but not the next snapshot. And in order for me to have, make sure I put the database back into the correct state, I need to have all of them. So when Hackathon does this, they have a background thread that, that will start coalescing, combining these delta checkpoints to make it basically one giant complete checkpoint. Um, but you need to be mindful of this, of, you know, of what, the file is that you're, what the file contains that you're looking at. So this is easier to implement. It wastes more space. Uh, but from, a, from, a, from engineering and a management point, this one's better. You, and one way to also to make this not have a huge storage overhead, like if I, my database is one terabyte, and then in the la, since the last checkpoint, I only update one megabyte, this thing stores one meg megabyte, this stores one terabyte over and over again. If I store the data uncompressed on a file system that supports deduplication, then the, the pages of memory that I write out are going to be duplicated over and over again, and the file system could, cut, could, could you know, comp compress them down for me. So you can rely on things outside the database to make this, this, this thing actually tenable. All right, the last one is going to be the frequency of how often we're going to take a checkpoint. Again, we could just take a checkpoint all the time, but that could slow down the regular transaction workload. Um, and so typically what you do is either say, I'm going to fire off the checkpoint at, every, uh, at a fixed interval, like every five minutes, or I fire off a checkpoint after I've written a certain amount of data to my log file. Right, so in this case here, like this one, you can bound how much time it's going to take for you to recover. Like say, if I crash, I want my database to, be able to come back in, 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 within five minutes, so I can take a checkpoint every every four minutes. So I know that when I crash, I only have at most four minutes of log I need to replay to put me back in the correct state. This one, you can sort of do the math and figure out, oh, if I can, you know, if I can replay the log at one megabyte per second, then if I set it so that you know, I I take a checkpoint after 100 uh, megabytes then I know I can recover in 100 seconds. So they're essentially the same thing. It's just sort of a different way to, to think about the problem. And again, some applications where, you know, some applications where you maybe don't care about things being super highly available within a single node. They can use replicas to hide all this. Uh, so maybe you take a checkpoint at, you know, at longer intervals or, or longer follow, follow buffer sizes. And so that way, if, like, if you have a replica, if the master crashes, you can, you can, the replica can come up without having to recover the log. We'll cover that on, on Wednesday. The, uh, the other thing, though, that we need to do, which every system has to do, is that if the data system is told, hey, we're going to shut down, then we want to take a checkpoint at that moment of time. We, we acquiesce or stop all the worker threads, let them finish whatever transactions they're running, and then take a you know, complete snapshot, a complete checkpoint of the database. Right? This is why you want to tell the database, hey, I want to shut down. Don't, just don't pass it, you know, you know, kill dash nine, and do a hard sig term. You want the database to be able to write things out gracefully. Because right, otherwise, it, if you do this, then you don't have to replay the law because you know the database is in the correct state. So uh, this is just a, a quick summary of what other uh, what some in-memory database systems actually do. All right, and as I said, most systems, in terms of what they're actually going to store, are going to do complete complete checkpoints. Uh, only Hecaton is doing the uh, is doing the the, the 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 delta one. And then what's sort of interesting too is like the, some of the MVC systems like Hecaton and, and uh, MemSQL are doing consistent checkpoints, again, which is take, just like take snapshot isolation, just doing scan, write everything out. VaultDB is not an MVC system, but they still can do cons consistent checkpoints because what happens is when you say, I want to take a checkpoint, they switch into this sort of specialized two-version or multi-version system, right? Where you just have the version of a tuple that existed at the checkpoint, and then you just have another version that's always the, the latest version. You, can't, you don't really have version chains other than you only have two versions. So that's how they're able to do consistent checkpoints. Altabase can actually do fuzzy and consistent checkpoints. Um, I think they do the same thing on the times 10 where like, if I'm shutting down, I'll do a consistent blocking checkpoint, but otherwise I'd normally take a fuzzy checkpoint. Right? And the HANA does fuzzy with time-based. So again, different database systems do different things. Uh, if you're doing MVCC, then my opinion, doing the consistent checkpoint uh, and taking a complete snapshot is the way to go. Because there's less engineering overhead of, of figuring out what to actually write out. You just scan through and write everything. So any questions about checkpoints? Again, after restart, I load the checkpoint in. And as I scan the checkpoint, I'm, I'm copying data into my tables. 
And as I do that, it's essentially like an insert. I update any indexes that are on that table so that, that, that way they get, uh, they get prop, uh, populated correctly. And then once that, all that's done, now the database is back online. Yes? Would the fourth thing index will also get copied, right? The question is, would the fourth thing to the index already get copied? Depends on implementation. You don't have to. But a fourth will copy everything. But you won't write right. it. Yeah, yeah, so fork, yes. All the indexes get copied, but you, but you, don't, have, you don't have to write it, right? It's probably, again, it's, it's a waste of space. My indexes are huge. It's not worth the, the disk I owe to write that out if I'm going to repopulate it anyway on, on recovery, right? It's the trade-off between computation and, 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 and storage. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about uh, very quickly is uh, how to do fast restarts. So everything I've talked about so far, the, 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 the crash recovery for uh, silo and SQL Server and all the checkpoint stuff, this is assumed that, oh, well, our system was operating, our system was running, something happened, somebody tripped over the power cord, lightning struck the, the data center, and we did a hard crash. It was unexpected, right? But there's other times we actually may need to restart the database system where it's not going to be from a crash, right? Very commonly, maybe we have to update our OS libraries. Uh, there's a technique in Linux called K-Splice that allows you to update kernels without having to restart the system. But let's say you can't always do that. Sometimes you have to restart the whole, the whole OS. Certainly, if you're going to upgrade the hardware, uh, some disks are swappable, but DIMMs I don't think are. Like, you have to turn the system off, put the dim, new DIMMs in, or certainly if you're moving to another uh, AWS instance, that's a whole other piece of hardware. And then sometimes you just want to update the data system software. Again, Oracle has techniques that allow you to do patching without taking everything offline, but uh, most systems don't have that. So let's say we want to do this one here. All, right? For the, assume these ones here, we have to restart. There's no way to get around this. Right, and start, restart the entire box. For this one here, though, we don't have to restart the OS. We don't have to restart the hardware. So it'd be interesting to see a way if we can restart the system in a, for an in-memory database and not have to flush a checkpoint out the disk and then load it all back in over and over again. So this is what Facebook can do in their SCUBA system. So I'll briefly talk about what SCUBA is in a second, but like, if you remember from the introduction class, we spent a whole, you know, this is what, this is what the students voted for, the most interesting system that they wanted me to talk about. Um, so, SCUBA is a, uh, it's a distributed in-memory OLAP system developed at Facebook to do event log processing. So whenever you load a page in uh, Facebook, they're going to keep track of what every single stage, every single service it touches for that request, record all the information, and then dump it off to SCUBA so you can do analytics and say, find me the, you know, explain to me why my page request went 20% slower than, than yesterday. Right? And because they're pushing out updates all the time for, the, for, their, for their web apps, they want to know whether things are, are, are regressing. So what they're going to do, though, is that when they want to update the, the database system software, that instead of shutting it down and taking checkpoint and loading it all back in, they're going to write out the contents of the database, essentially the checkpoint to shared memory, restart the, the process, come back up, see that my, my database state is now in shared memory, and suck it all back in. They're essentially using shared memory as like, as like a RAM disk, which is kind of interesting. So uh, again, I've already said this. It's a distributed memory, memory system. It has a heterogeneous architecture with leaf nodes and aggregator nodes. This is not too interesting for us, but just the, the, the thing to be mindful of is the state of the database is only at these leaf nodes here. Right? The aggregator nodes and the root node up above, these are stateless, and they're just combining results of queries that these guys are generating. So all the updates of inserting new data goes to these leaf nodes. So this is the primary storage location. So if we want to restart these guys, we need a way to, um, to again, write this out the shared memory so we don't have to load the check one from disk. As a high level, the way it works is that if I have a query like this, they're going to break up the plan fragments and say this guy goes down. Uh, these guys are all going to send their updates up, and then we just combine it together to produce the final answer. This is actually basically how MemSQL works as well, right? Because the story goes, the guy that founded MemSQL, he was at Microsoft, saw the Hecaton project, borrowed some of their, I was inspired by their ideas, went to Facebook, didn't, I don't think he saw Scuba, but he saw this, this, this pattern used in other systems at, at Facebook, saw this idea, and then combined it together to make MemSQL. All right, so there's two approaches to do this. So the, uh, we've already said this, uh, we, we, we could just do the shared memory heaps so that we could just, in our system, we modify the memory allocator 
so that whenever we call malloc for the, for the data we're storing in the, in the table, instead of being local to my process, now it's sitting in shared memory. And as far as I know, there's no overhead in the OS of saying something is in shared memory because it's just getting back a memory address and the OS knows that it should, the, that memory should, should last beyond the process lifetime. So to do this though, again, you have to modify JE malloc or TC malloc or whatever, whatever malloc implementation you're using to be able to write things out to shared memory and be able to divide things up uh, efficiently so that multiple threads can be writing to the same location. So in the paper, they talk about how they can't do uh, lazy allocation of backing pages and shared memory, meaning if I call malloc and something in shared memory, the OS is actually going to need to have that backed by physical memory. So they claim this is in the paper. They, Facebook bought the guy or they hired the guy that, 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 that created JE malloc. So in the paper, you talk about how they talk to the JE malloc guy and he says you can't do this. I posted this on Twitter, or at least the slides for this on Twitter, and then some dude reached out to me and said you actually could do this, like he actually tried it, and in at least in the newer versions of Linux, that you could, do, you could allocate memory and shared memory and not have it backed by a physical memory right away. Uh, so this part is actually not true anymore. So you actually could still do it this way. So you could have your memory allocator allocate pages on the heap and shared memory uh, and not worry about any thread safety issues or, or, or backing it right away. But instead, what they're going to do in this version of, of Scuba is that when I'm told my process is, is going to shut down, I stop all updates from any transactions, any queries, write everything out to shared memory, and then I can go ahead and restart. And so they do some extra stuff that, uh, where they keep track of what's the layout of that memory uh, that they're writing out to shared memory, like what's the version of the database system that wrote it out, so that if you restart and come back and you recognize, oh, I have some shared memory contents of the, of the database from what it was before I restarted, then you make sure that the layout is still correct. So they basically maintain some extra metadata in, when they write out the shared memory to say, oh, by the way, my layout looks like this because I'm on this version. So if I come back and it's incompatible, then I just load it back up from disk. So Scuba is an interesting system because in their world, this, this is not high value data. Right? It's not like your timeline or all your, whatever, your, your friend messaging crap. Like they, it's data that, that they could potentially lose. They don't want to, um, but it's not like you know, they lose money if this goes away. So ideally, if they, uh, you know, say a node comes back and there's nothing on disk, but the shared memory, sorry, the, the database system comes back, there's nothing on disk, everything's in shared memory, but the shared memory data is not compatible with our new version of our software, then they'll just backfill it from, from another disk from somewhere else. In their world, that, that's OK. So I like this idea. I don't know if anybody else does this with shared memory. Um, the most famous shared memory system is Postgres, but they're obviously not in memory. Um, and they're doing this to, to coordinate across different processes. This is like, this is now, uh, this is an interesting idea to think about because it's, it's passing data from one instance of the process to the next, even though they, they don't actually overlap in time. They're allowing the memory of the, 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 of the database go beyond the lifetime of, of the, the database system process itself, which I find super fascinating. Right, any questions about this? Again, if my database is, is one terabyte, and it, if I don't have this technique and I restart the database, then I gotta suck in one terabyte off a disk, which could be slow. But in this case here, I could come back and instantaneously have everything that I, that I need. Okay? All right, so just, just to finish up, uh, the, the main takeaways from this is that physical logging is probably the best approach you would want to use for an in-memory database, that, and it's going to support all possible contextual schemes. There are some advantages we can we can take a take a, or things we can take advantage of if we're using MVCC, like doing the copy on updates uh, to get consistent checkpoints by just you know relying on the idea of snapshot isolation to only see changes from transactions that have already committed. And as I'll talk about at the end of the semester, non-volatile memory is here. It is going to change how we'd want to do some of these logging checkpoint protocols, but the, uh, the high level idea will still roughly be the same. That we don't need to maybe re restore or don't need to log any undo information. If we're careful about where we store our data, then we only need to keep, keep track of redo information, and that makes the log replay much faster. Okay? All right, so next class, we'll talk about networking protocols. And I, don't, I don't have a list here, but we'll also introduce project two. I'll post this on Piazza. You guys should start thinking about how to uh, form groups of three, because uh, that's project. Th project two will be a, a group project. Okay? If you can't find a, a a group to be in, send me an email, and we'll figure out something for you. Okay?
I, I forget how many students are in the class. I don't think many people are dropped. So we should have enough to do exactly three, I think 13 groups of three or something like that. OK? Yes? So right now it is like this that there are six, seven groups. All of them are of two, two people. It has to be three. OK? okay? Yep. So make, make friends. And again, the, and whoever you, whoever's in your group for project three, will, oh, sorry, project two, will also be in the same group for project three. So if someone is like an a has hygiene problems, you know, if you, if, you don't, if you can't stand around project two, then you have to deal with project three, and that's not going to be good, OK? And I, if I have to break up fights, I, I've done it before, and I can do it again. I ideally don't want to do this, OK? <laughs> Any questions? Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit, because I ain't with that beer called the O.E. Because I'm O.G. Ice Cube down with the S.T.I. You looked, and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on. <laughs> I needed just a little more kick Hook like a fish after just one sip Yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off Eight ball just dropped up This ain't eyes hopped off And my hood won't be the same After Ice Cube take a same eye to the brain yeah.